Welcome everybody um, to the May board meeting. This is my first as, as the chair and I'm honored to do that. So uh, thank you for coming and try not to heckle me, please. Um, sounds like a, there's a couple of people that might, huh? So, all right. I'll, no, I am honored to be the chair, um, but I also don't, and I take this job serious and or the role serious, but I also, really it comes down to, it's not what we do up here. It's really the people you know, Tricia and and the rest of the admin and the library librarians and everybody else. So um, they're the ones doing all the work, so not us, but, but we do provide some oversight. So, all right, well, moving along. Um, any citizens' comments? Anybody? Did we get anything? Either, Patty? Okay. All right. Any remarks from the board? Well, first off, we're going to put at least somebody on the on the spot. Mr. Jeffrey Mendoza is um, is our newest board member, and I think it was approved what this morning. Is that right, or last week? Last week. So, thank welcome to you. And and would you like to say a few words or introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you so much. I'm. Uh really uh, honored and eager to have joined the library board here and, and to continue the great work and to assist you in any way that I can. So my name is Jeffrey Mendoza. I'm not originally from this area. I'm originally from New Jersey. I went to law school here though at UMKC. Um, after law school, I went straight to active duty with the United States Marine Corps as, where I served as a judge advocate. Um, and at, then during that time, I married uh, my wife who we met in law school. She's from the Kansas City metro area. So after my active duty service, we returned um, here to this area. We live here in uh, Johnson County in Overland Park. Um, currently, I'm a trial attorney for the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, and then along with serving here on, on the library board, I also serve on the board for the Hispanic Bar Association of Greater Kansas City and for the UMKC Law Alumni Association and as general counsel for the Marine Executive Association, which is a um, nationwide organization that assists veterans transitioning from um, active military service into civilian sector. Uh, so I'm eager to get to know every single one of you. I am bilingual. I also speak Spanish. So hopefully uh, we can assist our Spanish speaking community a little bit better as well um, during my time on the board. Thank you so much for having me and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, any other board members wish to say a word or two? All right, so moving right along. I oh. like the new setup better. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving right along, we got the Friends of the Library. I know we've got a written re report. Hello. Um, I'm Shanta Dickerson, Operations Director for the Friends. And I just want to say thank you, Chair Sims, uh, members of the board, and uh, Ms. Llewellyn Trop for taking this time to, to hear our report for the uh, progress of the Friends of Johnson County Library. So books, 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 books. Um, as we reported in April, we are working closely with Johnson County Library staff and facilities, the facility team, um, to resume donation acceptance at library branches. Currently, donors with a small bag or an armful, so folks are going to be really excited about this, are encouraged to drop off donations exclusively at Antioch, Blue Valley, Cedar Row, Gardner, and Leewood. If your neighborhood branch is not included here, we thank you for your continued patience. Just know that um, it's, we're coming. It's coming. Uh, we're phasing in additional locations throughout the year with the goal of accepting those small quantity donations at all branches by the end of 2022. And as we communicate with the public, we're reminding them, small quantity, not U-Haul. <laughs> uh, we continue to accept our donations, the, lower, the larger or the smaller, on whatever people choose, at Friends Headquarters every Saturday. We've bumped that up just a bit. It's now between an 11, 8, 11, 9 to 11 a.m. And that will allow for members only shopping at our pop-up sales. So some exciting news for Friends members there. Um, and if you're not a member, join us at join, um, I remember this, 
<laughs> join gclfriends.org. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at our next sale on May 14th. Um, if for some reason, I, I don't know why, but if for some reason you're not a member, um, the sale will be open to the public 1 to 5 p.m. And just an update, uh, we received, this is the second year we've received funding and uh, notoriety from, or notice rather, from uh, Friends of Kansas Libraries. Uh, they issue, this year, uh, we received a challenge grant with which they issue to Library Friends organizations throughout the state. Um, those challenge grants have a maximum of $500. So we received a, a bit of funding to kick off um, a trial for us. And we thank the Lenexa City Center staff for allowing us to come in and try out the disk buffers. Um, we have some wonderful uh, audiovisual processing volunteers who have been open to trying this out. And uh, what we're really wanting to do and currently doing our buffing disks. Uh, we receive a lot, a lot of materials that are just, you know, they've been removed from the uh, collection for a reason. <laughs> and uh, we'd like to send less to the landfill, so we're taking time to, you know, if there's a certain resale value, then we'll take time to, to buff those out and um, sell them online. Uh, long term, we're just monitoring this closely, and our goal is to, of course, increase revenue. But uh, long term, even if we break even, um, we, it's from the standpoint that we're you know, sending thousands of fewer uh, disks to the landfills. So um, ideally, we'll be able to get some grant funding for, for that, just for reducing waste. So that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Next is Stephanie. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephanie Stolsteimer, and I'm delighted to report on behalf of the foundation. And I want to just say thank you, Shanta. Shanta does an amazing job with the friends. The fact that the um, book donations are starting to percolate back up through the branches is so exciting because people leave the books there anyway. So... <laughs> It's kind of a kind of cool to have the bins there and the whole uh, transportation, um, and so we're just thrilled what the what the friends are are doing. Um, for my report, I uh, do want to talk about our in person events. Um, it did happen. <laughs> I, I talk about these things like they're going to happen, and then they happen, and then I tell you about them again. Uh, on April twenty seventh, we had an appreciation event. Um, for the 1952 Society members, uh, it's called Writing the Library's Next Chapter, the 1952 Society. It's in recognition of planned giving. We also invite the Reader's Circle. This is in recognition of individuals and couples for their cumulative giving of $10,000 and up, all the way up past $100,000. So it's just, uh, it turns out that friends and volunteers and donors all fit into these categories. So it's, it was really fun to have this um, event on the 27th. Um, we had about 80 guests who came and um, they enjoyed our feature guest speaker, Arthur Muir, who is the oldest American to reach the summit of Mount Everest uh, a year ago in May at age 75. Um, and we just want to spend as much time as we can appreciating uh, our library lovers. And um, in t also in terms of appreciating our library lovers, we did an, an event uh, for volunteers. Um, more than 60 volunteers gathered here at Central um, on April 20th. Uh, Amber Borg Slater is our volunteer coordinator, and they came up with this cool club, the 2080 Club. The 2080 Club are people who have given 2,080 hours of service or the equivalent of one full-time year to the library. Um, they had 12 volunteers who have done this, and combined they have contributed 33,980 hours of service. They volunteered from seven years all the way to 20 years. And um, 
Uh, it's just remarkable what people want to do for the library from the community. I'd also like to talk about some grants. Um, this is more just general information from 2021. We always apply for grants from area foundation and funders to support the library programs. And a number of organizations really want to give very specific dollars. So I'll whip up a, with a few, uh, they're in your packet, but the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, like to support race project for KC and online programming. I know Joseph is here for online programming. He's, they really like him. Um, Black and Fe the Black and Beach Foundation uh, loves to support the Makerspace. The Rainier Family Foundation has an affinity for the six by six program. The RA Long Foundation really likes brain fuse, tutoring, after hours, support for students. The Joanne and Bert Berkeley um, Blue Heron Foundation appreciates writers. I could go on, but um, this is something that we do all year long is try to connect very specific grants to very specific programs. And that's, um, we we continue to have good luck with that. Um, another thing for the foundation is finance. It's that time of year to do audits and tax returns. Woohoo! And so uh, we did finalize the audit. We got a clean management letter, which is just we're very exciting. And um, the 990 tax return is being um, finalized. And um, oh yeah, next month we're going to bring a really big check because our finance committee does this calculation about uh, the endowed dollars at the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation. And um, we cut a check for the collection. So next month we will have a, literally a big, literally we print off this big check and you're gonna have to pose for a picture. And it'll be a six figure number, which is pretty exciting. And the last thing, it's not in your packet, is um, annually when we can, when it's not a pandemic year, we do a tri-board event. So, library board, friends board, foundation board, um, get together for a nice social time to get acquainted with each other, to kind of celebrate what we're all doing, um, network with each other a bit so you know who's who and who's all working from the community. Everybody's a community volunteer. And um, so we get together and have a nice time. This time we have a little bit of a theme and it is a bit of, uh, it's uh, for Sean, we'll say goodbye Sean and um, send him off with our good wishes and uh, it'll be here and it will be June 16th, 530 to 630 and it'll be here at the library and you'll receive an invitation soon. So that concludes my report. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you. All right. Next is Janae, but Janae could not make it today. So we're going to move right along to the librarian reports. Although, well, first, I guess, Fred, um, to give your report. Thank you. Um, I was asked to uh, speak this evening on the legal path to property sales. And that's uh, timely because um, the library may, may be considering uh, sales of two properties um, in the future, uh, Antioch and Lackman, depending on you know, what happens. But so we're not used to that. Um, we've acquired properties. I think in my time around, I think we've been involved in 12 transactions where we have acquired property. Um, it's unusual for us to dispose of property, but that that's coming up. And so I think they thought it would be good for me to explain that process. Um, it is a, it's a two-step approval process. Just as when we acquire, when the library board acquires property, it enters into a contract that must be approved first by the library board and then ratified by the Board of County Commissioners. 
The same holds true under that same statute if it wants to dispose of library property. I should stop here and say that uh, I believe there are 13 properties titled in the name of the Board of Directors of the Johnson County Library. Uh, we lease space on the Edgerton Library. So, but it, that's how they're titled, Board of Directors of the Johnson County Library. And uh, the, contract, the library board would enter into a contract of sale and it would have to be approved by this board and then sent out for ratification to the Board of County Commissioners. So it's a, it's a two-step process, just the same as when we, acquire the, when we acquired the properties. Um, we acquire, the library board approves it, it's in their name, it goes out to the Board of County Commissioners for ratification. And uh, the same process would hold true here. There would be a contract approved by this board, and then it would go out to the Board of County Commissioners for ratification. So it's really, it's just that simple. And uh, would anticipate that any property that would be sold um, would first be, uh, there would be some form of appraisal to where we felt like we had a really good grip on what the value is of the property. And, uh, and, then, and then some form of, I mean, I, I, it's certainly possible that there could be a contract with a party um, without formally listing it, but I, I think that's probably unlikely. I think it's much more likely that it would be listed in some format to take various offers. It would need to be a really fantastic opportunity, seems to me, before the board, I mean, where it was just crystal clear um, so I, I would anticipate that kind of process on this. So when the library's ready to list those properties, and, and obviously they, you know, for example, Antioch is still very much in use, um, but when, when they're ready to, to sell that, then that's, that explains the process that would be followed. Any questions? Um, question. Um, so in terms of the, the decision to either sell or repurpose the property, is that one made by this board or by the Board of County Commissioners? Because I know this is something that came up at the last joint uh, meeting. Right. Um, well, it's, I'm going to give you the, the legal answer, and then I'm going to explain, you know, kind of in the real world how it works. Um, the, the legal answer is that only this board can legally initiate the sale of property. But the Board of County Commissioners, I mean, there's, a, there's very much of a legal relationship here between the two. So if the commissioners have a very strong feeling that a property should be sold, then obviously that's something that the library board is going to take under consideration. But the commission by itself could not force a sale. Nor could the library board, for that matter, if the commission didn't want to sell a property. It's kind of a two-step process. But this board... Um, is critically important. I mean, it, it makes that decision. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Fred. All right. All right. We are moving on to the librarian report given to us by Tricia. Thank you. We'll first have Dave Frotney with finance. Thank you, Tricia. And, uh, Good afternoon, board. Uh, I'm going to direct you to page nine of your uh, May board report. Uh, it's the total revenue report. Um, we are uh, capturing uh, where we were at the end of March of 2022. So we're approximately a quarter of the way through the year um, at that point in time. Um, and uh, revenues collected. Uh, it was a little over uh, 23.7 million, uh, or about 54 percent of the 43 point almost nine million that we anticipate collecting for 2022. Uh, this is on target for where we would uh, expect to be uh, around this time of year. Um, if you looked at the 2021 reports, we were at about 53 percent, so we're just slightly ahead of uh, where we were um, in the prior year. Uh, in, in total, uh, expenses, and this includes collections and encumbrances, um, we've obligated ourselves to just a little under $15.7 million 
uh, or about 36 percent. Now, while that sounds high, given that we're only a quarter of the way through the year, uh, I went ahead and just was checking this, and I, I do this uh, routinely. Um, went and took the collections encumbrances out, and then and then isolated the interfund transfer that's been made, and our total amount spends more like about 9.5 million. So that would put us uh, a little above 23 percent. So we're we're tracking a little under um, uh, by about a percent and uh, about 1.8% um, lower than where we'd expect to be at this point. So so we're, we're in good shape. Um, we haven't overcommitted ourselves, um, at least not, not on these reports and what I can see um, to date. So with that, I'll stand for any questions you might have. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome, Adam, to the stage. Uh, he always gives us our core statistics, and then we'll actually have Dave hop back in to talk about expenditures. Yeah, we're rotating up here uh, today. Uh, I'm Adam Wathen. I'm the Associate Director for System-Wide Services. I'm giving you your monthly statistical report. And so on the first slide, you'll see our physical and our digital usage. And you can see that in the month of March, we saw our physical usage uh, jump up slightly. Um, it's still pacing below pre-COVID levels, but uh, above last year's levels. And then in our digital usage, um, we had seen a bump last year uh, when we had closed buildings and we weren't serving physical content quite as much. And so we're pacing a little bit below that. Um, and this is the first time where we see that we meet uh, prior year levels in terms of 2020. And my suspicion is that we're working toward a transition from our ebook reader, the Access 360 uh, platform, to the Libby platform. And this might be a little bit due to that as we uh, wean people from the current reader and then have helped them to adopt our new Libby platform, which will be coming uh, later this month. And on the next slide, you'll see our visitation trend, and it trends similarly that it's uh, still below pre-COVID levels, but it's about 25% above um, the levels that we saw last year, and we hope to see that uh, continue to grow as we step into our summer programming, which Joseph Keene will talk about in a little bit, and um, as we see the return of some of our physical programming in this cycle and the next. Uh, any questions about those statistics? Okay, then I'll turn it back over to Dave for... Actually, I oh, did sure. have a question. Yeah, ask, I ask, was please. thinking about this. Go for it. Um, is there any way for us to, when we are looking at usage trends, to see if um, households have multiple cards? That when my kids were little, they had their own cards, but if I was just putting something on a hold now and not coming in, then what's the fun of checking out your own books if your mom's doing it. And so I was curious if we had looked at that, if maybe the, that our door count being off is a little bit maybe skewed if we've got a lot of people who have families that have multiple cards, but if they're not coming in for a lot of programming, you don't have four kids each checking out a book or two in their cards. And I was just curious if we had looked at that if that was even possible. Yeah, I think our programming does drive circulation to some extent because it drives attendance into our buildings. Um, uh, of course, some of our programming is off-site and that doesn't drive that circulation quite as much, although we try to associate materials and, and literacy with the programming, so hopefully there is a connect, connective tissue there. Um, the uh, I would say that the families with multiple cards uh, before and in currently are um, sort of similar in terms of how families might use those cards. Um, the, the number of items checked out probably still wouldn't change as much. It's the browsability, I think, that changes. So the, the number of holds have gone up and the people checking out on holds and using uh, our drive-throughs and things like our uh, curbside service and then picking up off the hold shelf. And I think that that's a result of pandemic uh, trend. And the browsing of our branches has, has suffered a little bit. And we hope to see that come back because if somebody happens into the library or comes to the library for another purpose, they might browse the shelves and check out books. And that's certainly the case with children and our children's book usage that after a story time in a, in a building, 
you'll see a lot of checkout of materials by those children and those families. And so we really do hope to see that return. Um, uh, I think there is a way that we can look at multiple cards in families. And uh, we've seen both that some families use one card for the entire family and some families have multiple cards. And um, both ways uh, have been effective ways that, that people use the library. And so it really depends on the family. Did that, I'm just, did I that guess I'm sense? more just curious if instead of having one family that had several cards, they're only using yeah. one. And if that then is right. skewing some of our numbers oh. a little bit, that they're checking out the same number of items, but it's registering as one interaction We're, instead of three or four? Uh, that's, we're actually counting gate count. Okay. And so it's how many people are coming in the building because we're, we're trying to count people who come into the building for any purpose, whether they check out materials or not. And so we have a lot of people that come in just to use computers or to use study spaces or to uh, for after school, we'll have a lot of teens come in and use our spaces uh, for a variety of purposes. And they may not check out materials at all. And so we aren't, we aren't actually counting how many cards get used. Okay. We're counting how many people come through the doors. Okay. Did that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going, Dave Rotney, I'm uh, going to go ahead and go over just some expenditure trends that we've, uh, that we're tracking and, and want to share with you. And I, I believe we do this every year. Um, I think I was here last May to also go over some similar expenditure trends. So. Um, on this first slide here, we're talking about our uh, collection. Um, you can see the physical collection in 2018 uh, spikes up there. There's about 3.5 million uh, that we spent. Uh, we purposefully did that as we added Monticello on um, as a new library location. Um, 2019 number, then it drops down there to about 2.8 million. In 2021, we spent a little over uh, 3.15 million in on, on the physical collection. Um, then we have some expenditure on collections by formats, and you can see uh, the various things that we, we track, uh, uh, databases, periodicals, uh, the e-books, e-audio, the uh, print, and, and our audiovisual as, as part of our collection. Um, the one, one thing that I'm going to point out, obviously you can see periodicals is, is something that it, it, it's beginning to, to drop and, and precipitately drop. Uh, the one thing that's really we've spiked up in the last couple of years is our e uh, books and e audio books offerings. Cause you can see in 2019, we were at around 570,000 and in 2020, 2021, we've increased that to about 1.2 million. So uh, a lot of that has to do with um, COVID and, and our pivoting there, but also just there's more offerings that are being um, given on those platforms. So um, next slide, please. Uh, expenditure on programming outreach. You can see that's an area that we've um, been significantly growing over the last six years. Uh, that spike in 2020 that we're showing there uh, actually has to do with um, the 2021 uh, summer reading program where we had increased um, that program and we've um, formalized that in our 2022 uh, budget. But we made purchases for the 2021 reading out of uh, in December of 2020, so we'd taken those in advance. Our 2020 number there was around 385,000, uh, and the 2021 number down to 286. I think what you'll see in 2022 when we bring it forward is probably going to be closer to what 2020 was, and maybe a little bit larger than that. And then uh, IT expenditures on our contracts, hardware, software lines um, you can see that there's we've seen uh, a pretty steady increase there uh, 2019 we had about 1.38 million the last couple years have been down a little bit uh, 2020 was uh, at about 1.27 um, million and 2021 was just about that same number uh, 2020 we had gotten some covid reimbursement funds for some equipment that was purchased and then in 2021, um, there was a number of initiatives, priorities that we had just had, were busy <laughs> trying to handle some of the other uh, crises that were happening, and we had some staffing um, shortage issues uh, and had us kind of, I think, not being able to fully do some of the programs uh, that, and projects that IT had planned. 
So I expect those numbers for 2022 to be up and probably higher than where we were in 2019. Um, next slide, please. Our expenditures on our building maintenance and custodial, you can see that also uh, seen a steady increase or rise over the last few years. Um, I would let you know that in 2019, uh, it was mid-2019, uh, we transitioned our uh, custodial maintenance uh, management over to county facilities. And so there's been a, a heightened focus on, on our custodial and maintenance efforts from there. So you can see 2019, it's been a little over 700,000. Uh, in 2020, it was uh, around 784,000. And then in 2021, 830,000. And then uh, I would also note we did get reimbursed in 2020 some of our COVID expenses, uh, facilities related expenses that were there. So that doesn't necessarily capture um, everything that was spent because we were able to um, uh, have grant uh, grants that we received cover some of those expenses. And then I uh, want more slide here that has, um, So, oh, no, excuse me, the library debt service slide, excuse me. Uh, this shows JCL debt. Um, over time, the facilities projects have shifted towards uh, PBC debt. So you can see uh, the, the grayish line is uh, library debt in total. Uh, the blue line's PBC issued debt versus other debt service that we had uh, previously committed to. Um, We've, we've shifted over to issuing PBC debt, which is public building commission debt. Uh, so any, you, you could see the, the steady rise in there. I believe the first PBC debt issued project was our Leewood um, expansion project. So that's what would have been um, on there in 2013. Uh, and we've added any of the facilities projects that we've done since that point, our PBC related debt projects. Uh, the debt service, would have been any projects prior to, I think that Leewood expansion um, was a, more like a general obligation debt that we'd issued. And we, I'd ha I'm happy to, I guess, um, tell you that we've zeroed out that debt. Um, and so the only debt that we currently have on our books is the public building commission debt. Um, in 2019, our total debt uh, paid was a little over 3.56 million. In 20 21, that number was down to 3.1 million. Um, this is, I think, really kind of due to timing. Um, in 2023, we'll be issuing, uh, well, later this year, 2022, excuse me, we'll be issuing debt for our Antioch replacement project, um, which will then have us beginning debt service payments on that in 2023. And so that amount's going to end up being probably back up to closer to where we were in 2019. And then obviously, uh, future debt we're planning to issue would, would also increase that number. So, and I think I have one more slide. There we go. Uh, this uh, is expenditure trends as it relates to our, um, our full-time equivalents and uh, total compensation paid. And you can see we've broken it out into, into the three categories, salary, health care, and other benefits. Um, our staffing was uh, at the beginning of this, uh, chart here in 20, 2012 was uh, probably around 268 FTE, um, and um, more more recently we we peaked out in 2019 with the 327.79 FTE, and again that goes back to in 2019 um, we had FTEs that were associated with our facilities custodial maintenance um, would have been on the library side of the ledger. And so with those transfers, we transferred 21 FTE in 2020 as part of our um, agreement with the facilities department. Uh, so, so that lowered our FTE count from the 327, almost eight that you see there to, to the 304.79 that's in there for 2020 and 2021. Um, the, Total compensation in 2019 for the library was around uh, 20 million 756 thousand, um, and that number in 2020 went down to 19 thousand 172. Uh, 19, excuse me, 19 thousand, 19 million 172 thousand. Uh, again, 2020's numbers are 
going to be a little misleading. Uh, you all or any of you that were around will remember we furloughed about 60% of our staff uh, for a period of time in, in 2020 as part of our COVID response. And so there were folks that we had furloughed somewhere between four to six weeks, depending on the position. So there's some, some savings that we um, encumbered there. Um, and then in 2021, uh, those numbers go up to a little over 20,661,000. Um, and then we did, did do some payroll equity uh, impact adjustments in for 2021. So the, those numbers are, are reflecting some of that. So with that, I know I went through a lot of information and uh, those slides rather quickly. Is there any questions you have on any specific slide or any expenditure questions that you might have of me? All right. Well, you thank have, you. I'm sorry. I have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For this salary and benefits expenditure, yes. do you have a, a, a greater breakdown of that um, by position, perhaps? Uh, so we do provide that. We have um, uh, state reports that we put together that has uh, them grouped by by position and, and, and range, and that's something we could certainly provide to you or any of the rest of the board if that's something you'd like to see. Yes, please. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Scott is on the next uh, presentation on the Comprehensive Library Master Plan. Good afternoon, everybody. Scott Syme, Project Coordinator for the Library. And on behalf of the Library, on behalf of the core team for this project, I'll give you an update on the Antioch replacement. Uh, next slide. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the meeting we had with the City Council uh, earlier in April. Also give you some next steps for this project, review the timeline, and then I'll provide a design update. Uh, we'll have Dake Wells at our June meeting. Okay, so first up, an update on the city. So the city asked, the city of Merriam asked us to come and do a design preview um, in late April. Several of you folks were there, thank you. Um, Trisha and Fred and David, um, some other folks in the audience were there too. Um, we had a we did a design preview for them. They had some great questions. Sean and Dan from Dake Wells spoke to those questions, I think, pretty well. And overall, I'd say the city council was very receptive to and pleased with the building's design. So that was great to hear. Um, so that's an update with the city. Next up, um, I'll talk about next steps. So the architects and the core team are working on the final development plan, which is what we need to be able to submit to the city um, to go ahead and get their approval on that. Uh, it'll start with the Marion Planning Commission and then go to the city council. We're expecting that in June, July. We are working with city of Marion and our legal council on some topics to be included in a um, second property conveyance addendum. Many of these are slight tweaks based on the evolution of the building and the site. Um, a few examples, we'd like to share a flagpole with them. We want to talk with, with the city about um, electric vehicle charging, Wi-Fi coverage, those kinds of things. Um, and we are looking forward to a property transfer and selling bonds later this year. Next slide. Here's a look at our timeline. We're at the red arrow. No changes since the last time you saw this. Now I've got some renderings from the architect to share with you guys. Um, the first few are about landscaping, and then the, the last couple are um, site, uh, updated site renderings. So this one talks about landscaping for kind of the ground level on the site, and you'll see a few different shapes and colors on the left. Um, the circles are trees, the dark green are um, taller grasses, and the lighter green is just kind of regular turf. So you'll see a planting, anticipated planting palette or schedule over there on the right. Slide. These next couple talk a little more detail about the green roof. So our goal is to, our goal for any, all the plantings on the site are to install great, sturdy, low maintenance, drought and heat tolerant plantings that add visual interest and seasonal color. Next slide. This is a look at the roof. Um, so the white kind of polygon boxes are where those light monitors are planned to go. Those little 
kind of pathway, those little weird shaped lines or pathways in between those so that the staff that need to maintain those spaces can get up there and do that. Um, and then you'll see some darker, more vivid greens. Those are meant to be the taller grasses. And uh, the thought behind that is we want to have some of those taller grasses visible from the inside as you're looking up out of those light monitors. Well, so when you're looking up, they'll be maybe, I'd say, 12 to 18 inches tall as you're looking up through the building, so you'll be able to see them kind of waving out there. Next slide. A couple of um, exterior renderings here. Let's see. The first one is a look at the building from the existing drop-off circle, um, something that's left out of this drawing. There are existing bollards there or kind of concrete poles to make sure people don't drive onto the site. You're seeing the green roof, the light monitors, that welcoming front porch, and a little bit of signage. What we're showing right now is a placeholder, and we're continuing to refine that. Scott, yeah. quick question. So the, the thing you see, the build, the structure you see on the right, is that the parking garage, or are we looking at it from the community center? So we're looking at it from the drop-off plaza. So in the foreground is the library. Kind of behind that, you can kind of see that parking stair tower on mm -hmm. the far right side of the drawing. That's and parking. Then it's not shown, but the community center would be if you panned off to the right side. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That helps. Yep. Sorry about that. Thanks for asking. Um, and then the next slide is a look at the building from the um, south side, so the hill um, kind of going down, down the hill towards the north. Um, that existing drive is there today where you see the car in the foreground. Um, you'll see the drive through area, so that's where patrons can pick up their holds and return their materials. And then on this one, just to orient you on the site, on the left is the parking structure. And then way in the distance on the other side of the library is the um, community center. Yeah. That is what I have for Antioch replacement. Any questions? Okay. I'll move along to DeSoto Spring Hill and Edgerton renewal study. This is a pretty short update this time. And the update is we're working on conceptual designs for these three locations. We expect to bring, be bringing those back to the board later this summer. Uh, that's it for the DeSoto Spring Hill Edgerton study. Okay. Yep. Any questions? Do you, have, um, do you have findings that came out of that that you're basing to make the conceptual plans on? We do. So... I think it was last month or maybe two months ago, we talked about what we'd heard from the community. Um, we also talked with staff about um, what they thought we needed to do out at those locations. Um, so yeah, that's what we're basing. And then we worked with admin to kind of like what we did for Antioch to get building priorities, what we want to focus on at those, those three. When you bring back the conceptual designs next month, could you also share with us what you base those on? Oh, definitely, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I have no memory of that conversation. So either we had it or, and I don't remember, or we just didn't have it. We didn't so talk about it. I'm just thinking I don't remember hearing anything about the findings and what we're basing any of this on. So that would actually be quite important for us to hear what you want to spend money on if we don't know what it is people want and what the findings were. There were a few general suggestions, very but it wasn't very, it wasn't very specific, so... I guess I want to hear specifically from the findings why you chose this particular conceptual idea. Okay. Because we haven't really heard any of that in a summarized, concise format. Okay. Yep. I'll make sure. Yeah, I'd like to hear the thinking behind what we're spending a couple million dollars on. So, And I'm also guessing that the BOCC would like to hear what we're basing the findings on. So, yeah. A last bit here is just to look at our overall timeline summary. So this is our um, capital improvement project timeline. No changes on this one since the last time you saw it. Next slide. This is our uh, capital replacement plan timeline summary. And we do have a change on this one since the last time you saw it. And that is talking about the Gardner and Oak Park projects. So we've talked about and decided to switch the order of Gardner and Oak Park so that Gardner can occur first. 
those thinking behind that is the work at Gardner is a little more technically simple and we'll be able to complete the drawings more quickly. Um, the work at Gardner also we anticipate won't require as long a lead time for the materials but just based on the work that we're doing at Gardner. Um, on the flip side, what our facilities partners are hearing for Oak Park is that those materials and trades require a longer lead time. So flipping those two allows progress to be made at, Oak, at, sorry, at Gardner and provides a little more time for the materials to come in for Oak Park. That is the end of my update. Any questions on this last bit? Thank you, Scott. Thanks. On that note, um, right now I am the... So to kind of educate, maybe Jeffrey, um, most of our big projects, we've got usually two liaisons from the board to kind of meet. And so with Brandy off, she was the second liaison for the Antioch. So it'd be nice to have a second liaison so anybody can volunteer. But probably keep in mind that at some point we'll have two liaisons for the, I think it makes sense probably to have two liaisons for the rural initiative study so you can kind of maybe think about if you would like to be on one versus the other but it is kind of a great way because Scott will provide updates in more detail on what you're hearing. I would like to be on the rural please. I can take over for Brandy on the Antioch. All right so Scott, you want to make sure she gets invited and then as as the rule and then we'll find a second person at some point. So thank you. Great. All right. I'd like to welcome Joseph Keene. He'll be giving us a summer reading preview. Thank you, Trisha. I'm a little taller. We'll just see if this works. It's good. Um, thank you. I'm Joseph Keen. I'm the event and program coordinator for the library system. And it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce you to a preview of what we have in store for the summer. Uh, so uh, quickly, as you might remember, in 2020, there was that thing that happened. And we ended up having to pivot to go online for most of our activities. And then um, we reintroduced uh, a, reintroduce much of our uh, programming, especially our distribution of summer reading materials back last year. We're continuing on this year. So this is kind of a, this slide right here is an evolution of what we've done and how we've done that. So um, there is a team behind all these tributaries. That's my only pun that I will have on this. Uh, of programs, outreach opportunities, and information that is disseminated um, surrounding our a summer reading program. This year's leadership team consisted of Kristen Devonshire, Melanie Fimler, Helen Hokinson, Sarah Matthews, Brian Ortel, Michelle Rainey, Jennifer Reeves, and Jennifer Taylor. Um, it's a privilege for me to be able to share with you the work that they've planned. Um, so I get to get some kudos from you to give back to them, hopefully. Uh, we will kick off our programming virtually in June with a launch party on Saturday, June uh, fourth, we will feature a story time with our very own Grace Bentley. Yes, story times are coming back. Followed by trivia with um, Kincaid, author visits with Ben Clanton, and a workshop with author Alan Wolf. A complete listing of all of these offerings and the ones that you see up there are available in the summer guide, as well as um, through the web calendar on the website. We are very, very excited to bring back some of our favorite presenters for our in-person offerings that we will be having this year, such as Mr. Stinky Feet and Priscilla Howe um, and our beloved Read to a Dog program, um, as well as some story times that will, be housed, uh, that will take place at Lenexa City Center, the new site uh, for the uh, Merriam Library outside of there, so we're partnering there, as well as the Blue Valley Library location. We do anticipate drawing uh, some crowds at these programs. Uh, so either registration in advance or a ticketing system is going to be implemented for those programs. So just make sure you register or get a ticket early in order to make sure that you reserve a spot for yourselves. Again, all of this stuff is available on the website um, or through the guide. I'm 
particularly excited about this next one. Movies and special entertainment before the screening will return this year as well. Uh, so these highly popular events will occur in July. Uh, we have reconnected with our partners at Lenexa City Center Parks and Recreation, City of Gardner, and Downtown Overland Park Partnership, LLC, uh, to bring these programs center stage um, for this summer. Uh, so bring a blanket, grab a picnic, um, and join us. Um, we will provide some fans, uh, hand fans, because it's going to be hot. This year does mark the first for June 19th to be observed at Johnson County. Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day and, and Emancipation Day, is an annual commemoration of June 19th, 1865, when enslaved African Americans in Galveston, Texas, were informed of their freedom and that the Civil War was over. Throughout the month of June, we will bring awareness of the holiday and commemorate through story times, walk and reads, book discussions, lectures, and writing prompts. What can I say? The marketing materials for summer reading this year, and if Sean was here, I've heard him say this. It's his favorite. Um, they're beautiful, simply beautiful. Uh, kudos to Alyssa, Andre, and our CX team for uh, putting this together. A special thanks to Jennifer Taylor. She's a creative service coordinator for the library system and her design work at adapting Sophia Blackwell's, uh, Blackwell's art, um, that's who the artwork is by, uh, to meet JCL needs. Incredible. You'll see it throughout the summer. You're going to see some different plugs on radio stations, um, um, also on PBS. Uh, you'll, so be on the lookout for that. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Uh, first of all, I absolutely love the Oceans of Possibilities theme and the T-shirt, the narwhals. I love that so, so much. Um, when it comes to, like, the marketing and I really feel like I need to know who's wearing a blow-up costume and is it going to be a puffer fish? Is it a starfish? Because as much as I really loved the unicorn last year, I don't feel like it's quite connected to the theme. So what kind of sea creature can we be anticipating or is it a secret? not a secret and there is a video up on the on our YouTube channel and I do maybe we can get that out to the board so that everyone can see it um, there are there are three staff members and I'm not going to um, divulge who those people are because you will recognize some of them okay maybe one of them is sitting at that table up there oh very nice <laughs> it's Fred <laughs> <laughs> Got a question. Well, that's the important part. So as long as we can see who's going to be in the blow-up costume, then that's... Well, I, I think all the... You've got a bunch of books that distributed to a lot of the schools. Did I think what you had almost, what, all but like five last year. Is that correct? I'm going to say that it was all but... I, I can't... I don't know the Whatever. exact number, but I, it was a low amount. I think it was five. What about this year? Did all of them participate? Did they have to opt in? I know... What was the thought on that this year? Um, I, I, I do not have the exact numbers on that. I'll have to check with our outreach um, to see what the exact numbers are, but it's very comparable to what yeah. it was last year. They just had to opt in, basically? And fill yes. Out a basic, okay, yeah. I know I and talked to I know to that we are working with library, uh, different schools, in order to get the marketing material out to them. So that is an initiative that we have started or re-engage more vigorously this year uh, than we had last year. Is it, are the schools getting it? Because I know I talked to my daughter's library and I don't think she'd had some of the marketing yet, but, but loved the books. So just, she wasn't sure how to, how she was going to. Yeah, we just recently um, uh, connected with Crestview. Okay. So I think that if that, we just recently connected with them and there's a, we have a list and well, so if you would got, like a list of the schools, I'm, I'm sure that we no, can provide that. No, I don't need that. a list, but I, I trust that you're doing... Yeah, I mean, I, I know that with the schools, I think, are ending, at least Shawnee Mission's the 19th. I assume that all the other ones, so we're running out of... Yeah, our major Silver initiative um, push for getting those materials out are April and May, so we're wrapping up. This is kind of the wrap-up of that. Um, so if the school hasn't been hit yet, it will probably be getting that information this next week. Um, if they if they haven't already received it, well, I know this is a lot of work. So I and I think it's a very valuable, especially yeah. to try to hit as many of the non 
not the folks that go to the library regularly, but hopefully to get the ones that don't. So I'm, I'm glad we brought this and really funding this. So thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. So next on the reports is me. Um, we'll talk about the ETC Institute, the Community Survey. survey. Um, there's an executive summary in your packet, but just to give you a, a few other um, pieces of information. Um, so the county contracts with ETC Institute, um, and we do, the county does a community survey, but then on the off year, an employee survey. So we're always getting some, gathering some information. The survey is mailed to a random sample of county households. And then uh, about 10 days after the survey goes out, there's another round of you're contacted by email or text uh, to elicit those responses. Um, this year, they got about 1,600 respondents, um, resulting in a 95% confidence level for those survey findings. So the random sample and then a, these results are from about 1,600 people. Next slide, please. So just for a little bit of context, um, looking at the last two years that they we've done the community survey, um, in 2019, the library got an 81% approval, and the next year we raised that to 85% approval, and then they always rank the most important services based on the survey results. And so in 2020, um, we were right there in the, the top five. Next slide, please. And then this year's results, um, so we've raised, so 81%, 85%, now we're up to 88%. We're gonna top out at some point at 100%, so I don't know, we have to go back to the bottom. Or, um, but you can see the top departments um, or services um, that got the highest responses from citizens. And then of course the overall um, satisfaction with the county at 82%. Um, this year, the, or for 2022, the most important services, um, Med Act, Public Health, Election, and the Park and Rec District. So you really see um, the last several years of what people used and were paying attention to and needed um, in that list. So um, of course, parks showed up there. We were all outside in every park and discovered new parks. So um, I'm glad it's a great opportunity. It was a great opportunity for citizens to really rediscover um, a great jewel of our of our county. So next slide, please. And then just for some of the a different slice of the data as far as service delivery. So these were some of the top um, respondents. Um, and I, I add this in here because the library's in here um, in several ways. So as far as polling places, many of our locations are polling places. And so that accessibility part, we have a small hand in that. And then the ballot boxes, if you might remember that from um, 2020, we have ballot boxes at several places. And then in general, the library has been a longtime partner with the elections office, um, election information, both in branches, but also on our website, um, and partnering with a variety of programming, access to candidates, um, as well as even during the pandemic, um, staffing from the library was um, put toward the election because the election was uh, a very large deal and we, they were not able to use their regular stash of volunteers due to COVID. So, um, so the library is certainly a partner um, with the election in many ways. Next slide, please. And then from the survey, the, the top priorities from citizens, both the most important services, but also the critical when they look 10, 10 plus years out. Um, and so we, you certainly see a lot of um, COVID ripples there as well, that those more st most important services over the past couple years certainly show up there. Next slide, please. And then a, a larger list of the, the most important county services um, to the respondents. And I include this list, um, you'll see those with an asterisk are county departments and agencies that we have um, an existing partnership with. Um, and so this list is a great opportunity for us to see what's the next level of partnership that we can offer them um, and to enhance that service for citizens. The other two areas that citizens uh, respondents thought additional resources should be devoted to were mental health and aging. Um, so those don't show up on this list, but it, they show up on the citizens are, are really um, interested in more funding going that direction. I want to 
thank all of the staff uh, who provide services to the citizens. Your work is really reflected in those numbers. Um, you don't get 88% satisfaction without lots of people doing a, an amazing job and really focusing on um, the mission. So I wanna thank all of the staff. Are there any questions I can answer about this survey or the library's numbers? All right, we'll invite Laura Blair to the podium. She'll talk about our leadership development program. Good evening, it's good to be here with you all. Um, just to give you a little context on our leadership development cohort, um, last fall the board requested um, that admin come up with a succession plan and they worked with Robin, Robin Smith from House Street um, to create that succession plan. Um, that was presented to you in March, and along with that, the leadership cohort was introduced. Slide, please. So this is the leadership development experience that we are using in 2022. Um, there is a leadership development course that will be three external courses um, created externally by um, by a partner, we have currently have RFPs out for that. Um, the next component is leadership luncheon with Fred and Carol Logan, as they are great supporters of the library and leadership development within the library. Component three is the leadership roundtable sessions with admin. Um, component four is our leadership book club. Switch how to change when change is hard, which I think is very appropriate considering all of the change that we have been through in the last few years. And then component five is monthly leadership reflections. So the good news is we are off and running. We are in progress. We have 10 participants who were identified as high potential um, by use of a nine box rating. Um, leadership book club is underway. They are reading their books and our book discussions are scheduled and they have signed up. Um, the first round table with admin was held this week with Sean Casserly. Um, we have also launched a Teams group where members can share their thoughts. We can have, you know, offline discussions. Um, and there's more to come as we get some of these other things scheduled and in place. But the participants are very excited. Um, that is, that's what I just, <laughs> here's my summary slide. Um, are there any questions that I can answer for you today? Great, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. I would like to introduce our new employee class this month. So folks in the, the first couple rows, um, many years ago before COVID, new employees came to the library board meeting and then when we went virtual, they were meeting offsite at a different location. So we're very glad to have you all back. Welcome to the library. In some cases, congratulations on your promotion. And we have one um, of our Metro colleagues observing this process. Um, she's interested in replicating some version of a new employee orientation in her library. So welcome April from Kansas City Public. And then we'd like to, I'd also like to personally welcome Jeffrey. We met last month, but welcome. If there's anything we can, questions we can answer, I know we'll be seeing more of you in orientation over the next couple months, um, but certainly let us know. We move on on the theme of leadership. I had a couple of things um, that um, I would like to hear from admin um, about kind of sometime over the summer. Um, and then kind of just an idea that I think could possibly get folded into uh, maybe the 2023 uh, leadership development experience or just for um, admin. Um, that part is um, really article publication as a part of leadership training that not everything we do is for glory. <laughs> Although glory is awesome. Um, but mainly, so much of, I don't know, library world is cooperative. And how would other systems necessarily know where innovation is unless they are publishing about it? And there are so many possibilities with PLA, ALA, Kansas, local metro stuff that I think it would just be good form to start making sure that leadership admin learn how to 
artfully toot your own horn about the things that you have been doing to share with other people because that kind of institutional knowledge being passed on not just amongst our own staff but across library land in general can only make all of our systems better in terms of what we're doing right, where the struggles are, where the innovations can come in. And I think that could do nothing but help our staff, our admin, and our patrons, because if we're publishing, other people are publishing, we're reading as well where the innovations are coming from. And I would leave it up to you and admin and all of that to find out how best to accomplish that. But we have some extraordinary things that this library system has accomplished, and I would really love to see more articles, more awards, and not just so that everybody tells us we're awesome, we know we're awesome, but so that we can share where we're getting it right, where we're doing stuff right and being creative. And as a kind of folding in with that is we've done a lot of kind of post-COVID after action reports about how we handled the thing. And we've seen where we pivoted and you know where innovations have come in. And that's awesome. We've got curbside. We have more digital presence that there are now the ways that people are accessing the library before we left them stuck at home. And so now we can meet those needs. And I think that that's fantastic. And as we do that after action report, as we've been doing that, um, that's been really beneficial, but I think as a part of our leadership training, there are also places where we can reflect how we were leaders through that, where we did well, where we failed, where maybe somebody panicked and needed more time to think. And so operationally, in terms of creating a culture that's both open and accountable and responsive, I would like to see something on this as... I don't want to say a therapeutic and emotional response, but that's almost kind of what I'm getting at in terms of where we succeeded, where we failed, where if we had to face something like this again, are the pressure points, the tensions, the places where we could have started to fall apart, where we could do better, be better. And so that might take some time and some reflection, but I think that seeing those things and knowing those things as well could be really, really important for our institutional memory along with succession planning, along with all of the formal stuff and the ways that we have to tick boxes and do metrics. But maybe something a little bit, I don't know, maybe more almost intangible that we can tick boxes and have those metrics. But how did we as an institution almost get through the trauma of the whole thing? And where could we do better in the future? Where did What were the things we just didn't know we didn't know? And so I would like to see something kind of going into the fall that addresses that, how we did, how we're doing with that kind of stuff. I think that's very doable. It, I, it, it's interesting that you brought all that up. Thank you, because when you introduced our um, colleague from the Kansas City Public Library, the article writing was the first thing that popped into my mind too and something that I've talked to you about for the last four to five months now. Um, I would really like to see that as part of the leadership development experience and I also jotted down why isn't this the new employee program? Why aren't we writing an article about that? Why, why does it take somebody coming here to learn about it? Why aren't we putting it out there for that dissemination of information? And then also our leadership development program. Yes, we may have gotten ideas from somewhere else, but somebody should be writing an article about this and expanding on also what we learned, how we've made it our own, where have, has it been positive or negative, whatever. So thank you, Bethany, for bringing that up. Yeah, and especially with the leadership program in particular, I don't know anywhere else in government, in a public entity, where you're investing in leadership training like that. And, and if there is somewhere fantastic, then we probably have something to learn from them. But if we're literally on the cutting edge of good government here, we should be sharing that information. And not just for vanity, but just because it's a fantastic advancement in, in, what, in how we can connect with employees and invest and all of those things that it's just 
cool, and we should be telling people they could be cool too. We're on it. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, all right, moving on to the consent agenda. Somebody like to make a motion? I move the Library Board of Directors approve the consent agenda. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we've got some informational items. So we have a couple uh, action items under new business. The first one on page 69 of your packet is a contract approval and temporary closure for some interior and exterior work on Cedar Row. Um, so you may remember last uh, month we pulled this agenda item off of the agenda. We were not quite ready for it, and so it's coming back. So it may seem very familiar to you. Um, the work that's planned for Cedar Row includes mezzanine ceiling being replaced, um, the roof access ladder, some electrical and lighting improvements, paving, and some in entrance enhancements. Wrapped into that are some ADA corrections, um, as well as some improvements to the security automation system in the building. Uh, during this work will go on and some of the work can happen while the building's open. There's probably about two weeks, up to two weeks where we, where we will need to close the building and that has to do with the, the paving and the entrance enhancement. Um, during, that, during that time, we will not be offering any services at Cedar Row, including curbside. So we try to have curbside when we can, even if the building's closed, but because of the entrance improvements, um, it's, it's not uh, safe for patrons, so. Are there any questions I can answer on? Do we know for sure that this is going to happen in the suggested time period of July and August? Do we have everything we need for this to go forward during that? Or um, do we want to, I mean, is, is it still? Right. Are we up against time yeah. or um, supply chain issues? Sure. I'm um, a little bit looking at Scott. Up here. Um, so we know that the, the, the work is going to take about two months, and we feel pretty good about that week or two that we need to be closed. Um, we're giving ourselves August as a buffer for this, so we are kind of thinking about the work itself takes maybe four to six weeks, and we're trying to give ourselves a little wiggle wiggle room on when it when it can occur. We're as sure as we can be, I think is the answer there. Any other questions? All right. Does anybody want to make a motion or is there more discussion? It's all one. We didn't. We didn't authorize the um, closures at a prior meeting, did we? Okay, I've lost track. But we can loop them in together. Then I move to approve the work order with Universal Construction Company for interior and exterior work at Cedar Row Library in an amount not to exceed 209516 and also move to approve a temporary closure of Cedar Row Library for a period of up to two weeks during July, August to complete the planned CRP work. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passed. Then the second item is a consideration to approve the Biblio Commons contract. This is a contract that you've seen before. It's an annual, or we renew it annually. Um, this is our online uh, presence for patrons. It's what you see when you're using the app or you're on the web page. So it's a company we've worked with for over 10 years. Um, this contract comes to you because it's over $100,000. Any questions? 
Now, is this the one? There was one, I think, a year or two ago, how we weren't too happy with them, but am I thinking of something else? That's but, a different... But we were kind of stuck. Okay, yes, still that's a different okay. company. <laughs> so we're happy with these? <laughs> we, we enjoy these people. Okay. I'll make the motion to approve the renewal of the Biblio Commons Agreement in an amount not to exceed $103,450.02. And Second. All, right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. All right, it looks like we have one more motion somebody needs to make. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We will see you in about 30 minutes. Don't know that I would have been able to do that.
Should we? 44, you can bring us back. All right, we are back for executive session. I think we got one minute or two minutes to spare. So would somebody like to make a motion? Um, David, before we did that, um, I just wanted to make sure that the minutes reflect reflect uh, some information about um, our leadership development program that was uh, started um, with a gift from uh, Carol and Fred Logan. I thought he just, do we need to make a motion to come back? Do we need to make a motion to be or back? Or do we from just, we're back. Session? No, you're back. No, we're just okay. back. Sorry. The chair, we'll so the back. chair declared we were back at 44. So the minutes reflect that. The minutes now can reflect the <laughs> county leadership fund and who it was initiated by. And now we can move on. Anybody, would anybody like to make a motion? I move pursuant to KSA 12-1225BA5 that the Board of Directors of the Johnson County Library extend an offer of employment to Tricia Solentrop to serve as County Librarian for the Johnson County Library commencing on the first day of July 2022 on terms to be agreed by the parties. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I think that's it. So well. It's not official yet, <laughs> but we hope it to be. And I think with that. I move that the library board adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we are done. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>